morning, everyone. Um, we're going to roll right in this morning. I'd like to convene the Environment, Energy, Natural Resources Committee to order. Um, this morning, uh, we have Dr. Sorensen. Dr. Sorensen, you can come down if, if you're ready. Um, Dr. Peter Sorensen from the University of Minnesota um, has graciously adjusted his schedule to come in. Um, Dr. Sorensen, I know you're much more comfortable standing up, and uh, unfortunately, uh, <laughs> you were allowed to do that at LCCMR. Yeah. Nobody questioned <laughs> it, but I've never allowed anybody to stand up, and I don't remember Representative Wagenius or Representative Osmond doing that either. So, so we can better hear the the microphone. Uh, that that would be great. Um, uh, welcome, Dr. Sorensen. You've um, been involved, I know, in a lot of research around CARP. This committee is very interested in Asian carp, so we'd like to hear. You've done presentations before, but um, we'd like to hear from you this morning for uh, like about 15 minutes. Uh, I know that, so maybe if you can do an opening presentation in about 10 minutes, we'll have some time for questions because I know you're off to uh, somewhere else. Welcome, Dr. Sorensen. If you could identify yourself for the record and who you're with, uh, go Thank ahead. Thank you, Chairman. I'm uh, uh, Peter Sorensen, Professor of Fisheries Wildlife. Conservation Biology at the University of Minnesota. Go ahead, Dr. Sorensen. You've done a presentation, I know, with um, uh, PowerPoint overheads. Right. Today we've asked that to be shortened up. So if you could just talk a little bit about how you think um, this group uh, would be able to finance some good work in the area of uh, aquatic invasive species, specifically maybe uh, Asian carp, and right. uh, also if you want to touch on zebra mussel or if you want right. to concentrate on Asian carp. Go ahead, Dr. Sorensen. Okay, Sorensen. well, thank you. I didn't really bring my presentation again, so I'll just maybe ramble a little bit, but if you, if you want to ask questions, uh, please do. I've been uh, at the University of Minnesota since 1988, and um, in, in 1990 I started working on sea lamprey control. Um, and um, I have 16 years experience with sea lamprey control, I have a patent for uh, sea lamprey applications which has been developed into a research center at Michigan State. And working with sea lamprey, which is uh, one of our first and worst uh, invasive species, I saw how a successful invasive species program can work. And that involves a, a long-sighted kind of science-based approach that's very systematic. So sea lampreys, some of you may know, are now controlled with a toxin. But that took five years of development and a long series of uh, experiments screening almost 7,000 compounds before they hit the right one. But sea lamprey are now controlled. After working with sea lamprey, I uh, came to uh, uh, focus locally on Minnesota waters where I got involved with carp. And that was particularly after a trip actually to Australia where carp, common carp, are highly invasive as well. And while visiting down there, I was struck by the fact that common carp, which we've long given up on here, are a uh, number, uh, the fifth, uh, a number five in the noxious species list in Australia and part of a 40-year management plan across uh, uh, the country of Australia where they were actually focusing and continue to focus all their efforts on p permanent fixes uh, such as uh, in, uh, actually developing uh, diseases uh, to control carp that would permanently fix the problem uh, because in their opinion anything less than that was a waste of waste of money and um, anyway I came back to Minnesota and was graciously funded by the LCCMR for a period of four years and my lab undertook the process of trying to figure out what to do about common carp which is probably still the worst uh, aquatic invasive actually in the state of Minnesota it's just been here for so long uh, people thought nothing could be done because like Asian carp, uh, a single female has uh, one to three million eggs a year. Uh, they live to be 50, 60 years old. Asian carp are also very long lived like that. Uh, that's an important point when you're dealing with invasive species. A two or three year subfunding cycle is meaningless in the life of an animal that lives to be 20, 30, 40, 50 years old. By the way, the same thing's true with sea lamprey. So we uh, started this process of just trying to understand how common carp work, which nobody had done, frankly, because people thought it was just hopeless. And uh, my point is that uh, as we started, my lab started to figure this out, we discovered things, such as we discovered the fact that carp, although they have one to three million years of eggs every year, um, most years, almost all, just maybe one in every 10 years do any eggs survive at all. 
they were actually naturally being controlled by game fish in our lakes. And we were able to pull that apart and are now starting to control carp by actually restoring wetlands which were seriously degraded, which are the source of these young carp, and, uh, re and fix that. As well, we discovered that the aggregate, uh, this took a few years in very precise ways so that we can sometimes remove them in the summer, in the winter, and we now have control programs for that. So the lesson is the approach to invasive species, like a lot of, uh, a lot of issues, uh, and I, I was going to mention briefly, like frankly, medical science is a, con is a really complex thing. You have to take a multi-pronged approach and a long perspective. Uh, you have to uh, look for the weaknesses because every species has its weakness and you have to move forward in a systematic manner and be patient. But if you do that, uh, there's considerable potential uh, for success at various levels. So I have proposed, uh, frankly, a, um, a research center at the university to take that perspective, which is modeled on successful programs being run out of Australia and the Great Lakes for sea lamprey to help address uh, not just Asian carp, but the variety of invasive species that Minnesota now has, and, and frankly, unfortunately, we'll be getting, because they are moving up the Mississippi River from the lower part of the river, and they are moving from the Great Lakes through uh, you know, Duluth and as well as through the, uh, uh, sh uh, the Ship Canal in, in Michigan. So um, basically, I'll just overview my, my perspective on it, and then I, I Dr. guess... Dr. Sorensen? Yes. Thank you. Excuse me. That's the no problem. Dr. Sorensen, you specifically brought forward a proposal, and maybe I'll ask Representative Wagenius to come up now yes. and sit by you, Fine. if she would, because she's got a bill. But you had a bill, or you had a presentation at uh, Lassard Sam's that identified a couple million dollars you yes. were looking for. What was the time frame that you wanted the couple million dollars? How long would that last for? And then Representative Wagenius can just tell us quickly then her bill is a little different than it's your a little $2 different. million dollar proposal. So, Dr. Sorensen. Uh, specifically, my, uh, my proposal was for uh, eight years of funding and uh, it was, had five components. Uh, very briefly, one was to look at uh, new detection systems for invasive species because if you don't know where they are, like exactly where they are and how many they are, uh, it's very difficult to do anything. Uh, new uh, control schemes uh, to, uh, to control them, and this included a specific position for zebra mussel, which I see is a really big inadequacy right now in the, in the state here. Somebody to look and bring new technologies in, as well as common carp. Uh, something, somebody to look at developing new barrier systems that were actually designed specifically for our fishes that we are facing problems with, not not a technology being brought in from somewhere else, which has been the case all along here. Um, and uh, also is looking for uh, some money to, uh, money to look for eradication schemes, particularly uh, actually focused on new pathogens. Every species has its weakness, every species has its diseases to see if we could bring these in. That would be sort of the silver bullet. And also, uh, I think very importantly, an extension uh, position to uh, allow the university and its research capabilities and research capabilities across the globe to be able to funnel that down to the DNR and uh, watershed managers and so forth. So that was my proposal. And, and Dr. Sorensen, you specifically had a price tag of $2 million. Was that for how long of a term was that $2 million? So my proposal was uh, $2 million a year to, for those positions I described and we needed $2 million to get up and running. Uh, building repairs, we need to refurbish tank systems so we can have zebra mussel in the lab and can try different toxicants. Thank you, like Dr. Thornton. So your proposal that you brought forward to Lassard Sam's was a package of, of, uh, of $2 million a year was that proposal. Representative Hansen has a question, then we'll go to Representative Laginius just to lay out uh, uh, her bill. And uh, members in the audience were, were having a um, uh, overview of these bills as informational. We won't be voting on these bills today, but we're trying to take advantage of people availability to come and, and talk to us and get a feeling for it. I do believe this uh, Asian carp situation, uh, we're trying to work with the administration. I believe that that will probably be the first bill we see uh, back here before the committee. Uh, Representative Hackbart, 
Representative Laguini has had bills dealing with that, and I believe those, uh, specifically the barrier bill, may be one of the first, depending on sure. how far we get with the uh, Senate and the administration. Representative Hanson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I know that Dr. Sorensen has to leave quickly. So um, my question is, there's been uh, the federal government over the last few years has put a great emphasis on uh, the Asian carp uh, in Illinois, uh, right. millions of dollars, and right. I believe there's been a research effort. Can you maybe compare and contrast what has happened and what is needed here? Dr. Soren, uh, on great, the research side. Great question. Uh, actually, that's where I was yesterday down in uh, St. Louis at one of the Asian carp research centers down there. Uh, the work on Asian carp uh, being funded by the federal government is, uh, and I'm actually partially funded by them, not, not to a great amount, but uh, is entirely really focused on uh, preventing any more carp getting from the Illinois River into a Lake Michigan. So that's the focus, and it particularly centers around uh, testing for carps in the presence of Chicago Ship Canal, uh, developing air cannons to stop them from moving that na through that narrow passage that separates. This is a passage that was constructed between the Illinois River, which goes down the Mississippi, and Lake Michigan, uh, and they don't want any to get through there. Uh, so they're, they're developing air cannons to stop them from moving down there. They're spending millions of dollars on eDNA testing around that area. Um, they're trying to develop some poison baits, um, and they're doing some basic ecology work. So none of it's really germane, directly germane to the ecology of the river systems up here or to stopping uh, fish from moving up here preemptively. Um, uh, it's, uh, although it's a lot of money, it's still pretty limited in some ways in, in scope. I hope. Thank you. Representative Wagenius, do you want to walk through uh, your bill just in a real quick overview? I, I'd actually like to wrap up uh, uh, Professor Sorensen's time and your bill just in the next couple minutes. But you have a bill, and if you could just give us an overview, and folks certainly will get to, to look at the bill and, and evaluate it, and we'll get to hear it again later. Well, let's, let's just start with, I agree with what Dr. Schwartzen wants to do. Uh, and what I see is the problem uh, is not what his proposal is, uh, but our two-year funding cycle and how that is an impediment uh, to getting something done like the thing he wants done. So what I want to the mic. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I what I want to do is go over the practical issues of uh, hiring what I call investigators, and I call uh, Dr. Sorensen the FBI for invasives, because what he's trying to do is to understand his enemy uh, so he can control it. So the first, the practical problem is our two-year budget cycle, and it is an impediment to any kind of long-term commitment. Uh, and in this case, as he said, it's going to take a long-term commitment uh, to find solutions. We don't do it every two years in a budget cycle. And we need to attract, as he was outlining, some new investigators to this state. And we're not going to get people who have uh, our the best and brightest of the investigators to move to the state for two years. Um, not, just not going to pack up and come for that. So the, the practical solution uh, is either to use funding from the lottery or the legacy or both. And both work well because in both we have had a history of and we commonly can set aside money for not just one year or two years, but we can set aside money for five years or six years or eight years. He proposed eight. In my bill, I propose six, uh, that we set aside money uh, for six years. So you will see that in my bill, the math is done based on six years. Uh, it's not a magic number. It's just the, the one I used. Because one of the things that I think we, we understand is that once we get new investigators in this state, new, uh, new scientists in this state, and they have a track record here, there will be new opportunities for them to attract uh, money. So my appropriation in this bill is a one-time appropriation with the expectation that the university would take over the funding after six years, uh, the university in combination 
uh, with getting grants from, say, the National Science Foundation or something like that. So there have been the questions of constitutionality of using uh, lottery money and legacy money. So I want the page, if you would, just to hand out uh, copies of the Constitution, and you will see uh, what I have highlighted here. Uh, you know, the, the lottery uh, money has been available since 1988. And at the top of this page that you will see um, is section 14. And I've highlighted the words uh, in the Constitution that folks uh, have used to allocate the dollars. And it's protection, the state's water, and fish. Um, and traditionally, that has uh, included hiring scientists to figure out how best to protect water and fish. Dr. Sorensen has actually been funded three times by the lottery money starting in 2003. Uh, and I think uh, we would agree that this money well spent. Um, but, I, but I bring up that uh, mainly to show you uh, the words of the Constitution. Section 15 tells us how we can spend legacy money. Specifically, the outdoor heritage money can be used to protect wetlands and habitat for fish, and the clean water money can be used to protect water quality in lakes, rivers, and streams. And there's that word protect again that allows us to allocate money to investigate the things that are harming or could harm habitat for fish and the water quality in lakes, rivers, and streams. One of the things I will note that's in my bill is the practice that the uh, LCCMR uses, and that is not, if, uh, not funding administrative costs at the U. It only funds the things that are directly involved in the protection of the state's water and fish. So one of the practical issues that we're going to have to work out is having the university take over the administrative costs. But they've been doing that for Dr. Sorensen because LCCMR has not funded that. And I think that's the same uh, kind of rule that we would have to use for the legacy money. Representative Wagini has said, OK, I just want to make sure, does, does anybody have any questions for Dr. Sorensen? He's going to actually get up and walk out here in the next couple of seconds. Representative Torkelson. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Dr. Sorensen, for being with us this morning. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, appreciate that very much. Uh, Representative Wagenius highlights the language of the Constitution, and uh, as far as the Clean Water Fund goes, the money is to protect water quality in lakes, rivers, and streams. Could you kind of outline how you see your work as protecting water quality? Dr. Sorensen. Uh, it, yeah, good question. Um, actually, it's directly germane. Uh, I see uh, water quality through my work with watersheds as um, basically uh, being defined as uh, the, the uh, clarity of the water, the things living in the water, the things that eat the things in the water. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, it's sort of an integrative thing of how nice it is to swim in, drink, look at, enjoy. That's quality to me. And uh, the carps that we study destroy water quality. The common carp uh, eat things off the bottom. They increase the turbidity. They remove the plants. And that causes algae blooms. Conversely, the Asian carp are extremely uh, efficient filter feeders that uh, dis greatly disrupt food chains and remove all the uh, plankton from the water so that they become clear and devoid of all life. And the game fish disappear. So that's all about, uh, at least uh, from a biologist's perspective, that's, that's quality. Uh, that's the basis of quality is the biology of what lives in the water. Follow up, Representative Parkleston. Uh, well, thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. You know, the, the issue of water clarity is always one that we kind of wrestle with on both sides. Right. Um, sometimes we look at improved clarity as an improvement in water quality, right. and you're saying that in this case the improved clarity is actually a detriment to water quality? It, cer it certainly can be because what happens with Asian carp and uh, zebra mussels is that uh, they, which I haven't worked directly with, but they remove certain types of organisms from the environment, leaving others. So you're still left with the situation where you have some pretty nasty blue green algae blooms uh, later in the summer. And um, 
So it just really drastically alters things. That's uh, so. Yeah, it's mixed. It's it's confused. It's complicated. But you'll, there'll be fundamental changes in how uh, water systems work in Minnesota, how people enjoy them for fishing, swimming, drinking, etc. Uh, so it's about quality of life as it is as much about the specific particle. chemical. Thank you. Just one more question, Dr. Sorensen, and thank you again. Yeah. Um, is there a difference in water quality effects uh, in relation to Asian carp as compared to common carp? Uh, so yes. And could you uh, identify that? Yeah, yeah absolutely. So uh, what, what common carp do, and they, they're kind of contrast with each other. So what common carp do is they, uh, they're bottom feeders, so they feed in the bottom. And they, uh, so this is why I'm funded by a lot of wo local watersheds, because their water quality is perceived as being horrible, and it is. And uh, these things feed in the bottom, they, uh, and they do so, they can dig up to a foot or two in the bottom, and that causes great enhancement of turbidity, and as they do that, they rip out all the plants, and the plants are the foundation of the food web, so that there's a general collapse and great disruption of all the plankton communities that feed the fish and the birds, and, and the whole thing. So they make water much, much more turbid and uh, odorous and, and just outright unenjoyable for both the organisms that live there and the people that use the water. Um, and the habitat, the habitat's wrecked. Representative Hansen. Uh, I'm sorry, Representative Tarkles. Well, I'll follow up. I was looking for the contrast between so the, and the carp. So the Asian carp, it's sort of just the opposite. Life isn't easy. So they, uh, they basically are extremely fine filter feeders and they go through the water and they uh, basically sort of the things that the, that the common carp are promoting, they start to remove. And uh, they remove all these fine, uh, so the basis of the food chain, the habitat, are the things that grow in there, these, these, these plankton, and they remove all that. So they cause great increased clarity of water at certain times but this causes a whole change in food chain and, and it, will, it will clarify the water in early <coughs> spring and summer. But then usually there's a collapse at the end of, end of the year because they leave certain types of undesirable, uh, noxious, uh, I, I know it's complicated, blue-green algae in the water which are odorous and poisonous. So it's, it's really a, uh, you know, we've had stable ecosystems, high quality habitats in Minnesota since the last glaciation for about 10,000 years. It's all changing with these things. And uh, it's a mixed bag. Some ways that it will maybe a little bit better, but most ways on average it's, it's a lot worse. Thank you. Representative Hams. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Dr. Sorensen, yesterday we had a presentation from DNR about minnows and, and the Dakotas and had some photos of, of Asian carp minnows uh, and showing about the importation potentially in the bait, bait, yeah. in the bait, in the bait yeah. industry. Um, when I was growing up, I remember common carp moving through open drainage ditches. Yes. Uh, can uh, both common carp or Asian carp minnows move through drainage systems? I by, believe. By I Dr. Sorry. I, I'm sorry. Yes, I, I certainly know common carp can, and um, easily, and. Um, uh, Although actually there's an easy fix for that, and that's, uh, that's where I'm going in a few moments. Uh, bubble systems can hold them back. Uh, I believe uh, there's increasing evidence that uh, uh, silver carp also move through drainage systems into uh, lakes that adjoin uh, large river systems. And that's actually the guy I was visiting in St. Louis yesterday. That's one of the things he studies. That's Follow a legitimate up. concern. Thank you, Dr. Sorensen. Follow up, Representative Hansen. Mr. Chair and Dr. Sorensen, um, and just to clarify, that would include op open ditches and culvert or pipe? Dr. Sorensen. Certainly open ditches um, for both species. Um, uh, certainly culverts for common carp. I, I do not know for silver carp about closed culvert. Thank you. Representative Anderson. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, carrying along on the, the uh, similarities or differences between common carp and the Asian carp, in terms of control, are they related more than just by a single name, or are there, in the research on common carp, are there any things we can carry forward in the attempts to control these different kinds of carp? Dr. Yes, Sorensen. Yes, yes, I think there's quite a bit to be learned and, and used. Uh, both species uh, uh, are somewhat closely related, not incredibly closely, but both, so 
when we develop control mechanisms, one of the things we like to look for are what we call integrated controls, multiple tool sets that target weaknesses in their ecology. <coughs> and these species uh, share some uh, key points in their ecology. Uh, they both uh, spawn every year and have several million eggs and live for multiple years. Uh, but they spawn in areas, they spawn with tiny eggs in areas where the eggs are susceptible. And at least in common carp, we found this is their Achilles heel. The eggs are incredibly vulnerable. They're just tasty little morsels, frankly. And if there's healthy habitat for other fishes, uh, we find that they'll eat every single one. It's amazing. They'll eat every single one. It's just like candy to them. So the, the uh, and I, I think the same situation is, is true with Asian carp. All the eggs are being released in the middle of the river. There's still, that's a real weakness that, uh, frankly, the federal government isn't looking at yet, just because they can't do everything. But that would be one weakness we would immediately start to explore with Asian carp. Um, so that's what, another huge weakness is that they, might, they have to migrate to these areas to spawn. And um, combined with that, they both uh, uh, have incredibly good uh, sense of hearing, uh, about 50 to 100 times better than our native fish, actually. Uh, they, they're, they're really uh, sensitive to sound. And uh, that means that um, it's possible, and this is what we're developing for common carp, with, with LCCMR funding, uh, to develop uh, uh, small-scale uh, bubble bubbling systems that produce sounds that deter them. And I'm almost certain, that's why the silver carp jump, that, uh, that bubbler systems could be very effective against them if targeted in a, in a reasonable, reasonable manner. So that's two tools that, that should be really good. Um, they both also are very well-developed sense of smell, and they use pheromones. This is something I study. Chemical cues communicate to each other. Uh, they look the same to you, a male and female carp, they look the same to each other. They tell each other by smell, and they use common sets of chemicals. This is what I'm being funded to do with Asian carp. And I believe that pheromonal controls and baits and attractants would be useful, or, you know, different flavors of the same approach, uh, to build an integrated toolbox. And um, so there's a lot of, that, that in essence, I think, are three pretty major ways. So I see, yes, there's some distinct differences, but they're more com there's more in common with each other uh, uh, than there are differences. And certainly, they're, they're both invasive for very similar reasons that, that could, could be targeted. Representative Fabian. Nope. Were you done, Representative Anderson? Uh, uh, Representative Purcell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just to follow up on the water quality, um, uh, it's it just a, a more of a comment than a question, but um, to Representative Torkelson's question there on water quality. You know, we we designate uses in Minnesota for our waters, and and I think it's important that we do that. I'm glad we do, uh, but we can have uses that you know maybe some folks in some areas of the state will want carp to have a designated use. We got a carp pond. That's what we're going to have. Most of us, at least in my part of the state, we don't want carp. And, you know, having, uh, having uh, people out there skiing and these fish jumping out of the lake, that's, that's not what we want. So I, I very much tied to the quality of our designated uses. So I, I, I just wanted to put that out there because it's really important. There's, there's no way we can, we can have our recreational economy and have these fish jumping out of the lake up in my neck of the woods anyway. Thank you, uh, Representative Purcell. Representative Dill. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair and Doctor. Um, I may, you may have answered this before, before I was here. I'm thinking that if the Asians get up into the upper watershed, that the ducks are really going to have holy heck raised with them because they're not. We already have a problem, and <clears throat> with the lack of wetlands that we need, oh, yeah. the wetlands that we still have. I mean, I'm thinking of net lakes near or Minnesota. On a, on a native reservation, if you had Asian carp in there and you have common carp in there, I mean, the, the hundred plus thousand ringbills that go through there every year aren't going to have anything to eat when they arrive. Sounds to me like is that yeah. Between Dr. Sorensen, uh, yes, I'm sorry. The, the, the way I look at it, uh, between the common carp destroying the bottoms and the Asian carp destroying the top half of the water column, there isn't going to be much left. It's not going to be good. I can't see any pluses in it at all. Uh, these these animals, uh, you know, well, Asian carp the same same way. Common carp now are 50 to 70 percent of the biomass of many of the lakes around here, 
you don't know it because they're crafty. They sneak around in the dark, turbid waters that they've destroyed. But that, that's what it is. Uh, they, they control the ecosystem. And the same thing's true with Asian carp down the Illinois River. Uh, so everything kind of, they, they're what we call environmental engineers. They re-engineer it. So the things that used to do well, the ducks and many of the game fish, not all, but many of the game fish we're familiar with, uh, the plants, it's, it's, uh, it will all change. And I don't think it's going to change for the better. Follow up. Representative Deal. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, this is a little bit different than what you talked about earlier. You talked about predators that are eating the eggs yes. of the common carp. So would that be like crappies or bluegills or northern pike or what is what Bluegills are in predators? particular. Dr. Sorensen, thank you. Yeah. Um, additional follow-up, Representative Deal? Nope. Thank uh, Representative Torkelson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you again, Mr. Sorensen, or Dr. Sorensen. Yeah. Um, one other question. This may be outside of your realm of expertise, but uh, could you describe a little bit about the role of carp activities in releasing phosphorus into our waters? Dr. Sorensen. Um, that's a really interesting question. It's not totally out of our uh, getting back to water quality issue. When I started this work, about 10 years ago, I defined water quality as just uh, chemicals in the water and that kind of biochemical measure. But I soon realized that what people really care about when they talk about quality is how they perceive it, how they use it. And phosphorus is a big issue in that, that area. So uh, we're funded by watersheds and we measure phosphorus routinely. So the relationship uh, we've discovered with carp and phosphorus is an indirect but uh, important one. And that is that uh, although they stir up the bottom, uh, that isn't releasing too much phosphorus. But what's the real, the real problem is that uh, common carp are environmental engineers and they totally destabilize the system by destroying the basic ecosystem itself and the plants and the plankton that live in there. So when we have large numbers of, of carp and phosphorus, the problem is what they're doing to the plants and the phytoplankton which are recycling nutrients in the system, not that they're directly having that effect. Does that follow up, Representative Some Torkelson. sense to you? Yeah, thank you. And would the Asian carp have a role in the mm -hmm. amount of phosphorus in our waters? <laughs> well, they they will in the same sense, in that they're really environment. I mean, this is it's never simple. But I I think uh, I'm sure they will because they will massively re-engineer and design the uh, the food webs in those systems, and that's the food webs are what determine how much often how much free nutrients are available. Um, and uh, you know we've discovered that if you don't deal, by the way, with these invasive fish, that role is so dominant, you're not going to really fix the phosphorus issues. That's been true in many lakes that we've looked at that. The phosphorus is largely what we call internal, coming from within inside the lake, so it's how it's being cycled by all the, I mean, there's some coming from the outside, but you guys have spent a lot of money and time fixing the outside sources in many cases, not all cases, at least the urban areas. So there's a lot of residual phosphorus that's totally recycling all the time. It's, the lakes are alive. I mean, there's, it, it is what it is, clear or it's turbid because of things living in there, and these carp are gonna just really, they are and will dramatically alter that. Um, thank you. Yeah. Representative Hack, or Representative Tarkelson. No, Representative Hack, uh, Thank you, Mr. Chair. Dr. Sorensen, uh, th this issue's been around a long time, these Asian carp, but we've talked about this for, I don't know, uh, five, six, eight years now. Sure. And we've probably been dragging our feet and not doing what we should have been doing a long time ago. Uh, all kinds of studies, research, what are we going to do, which way should we go, how much money are we going to spend, where it's coming from. Uh, so we're kind of behind eight ball right now, and what are we going to do? And we've got to do something now. But uh, I think other places and other states and uh, other universities have been doing studies, and, and there's been research uh, done, and there are research centers out there, and I believe there's uh, professors that are working on this in other states. Um, you know, listening to the, this debate for a number of years now, it seems to me that there are places that are doing this already. Um, what is different about your uh, about Representative Guinness's bill and what you might be doing with that money as opposed to what's been done already? Uh, uh, what is what is the research that's been done so far, 
I mean, uh, uh, is it going to be duplicative? What's different? Sure. Uh, I know that there's a, a, is it in Indiana? Is it Notre Dame? Notre Where Dame. is it being done now that uh, a lot of extensive work and research has been done already? Uh, how are you going to uh, enhance that or, or move on sure. from that? I mean, are, are you going from what they're using and moving beyond that? Or where, what, what's different? Dr. No, no, it's a, that's a great, great question. Um, so actually you touched upon the only other center that I know of, University of Notre Dame, which is a private university uh, in Indiana. And uh, there, uh, though they do work a little bit with uh, smallmouth bass issues, which are a local issue, in, and crayfish, which are an in issue in Indiana, uh, they're not substantive issues here. Uh, frankly, ne neither are Asian carp in Indiana. Uh, what Indiana has specialized in, David Lodge's lab, is eDNA work. And they've developed that tool and that approach, uh, measurement of DNA in the water, as a way of monitoring, uh, monitoring presence of invasive species. But they're really not um, dealing with, uh, for instance, uh, Asian carp directly. Uh, they're private Catholic university uh, and academic circles. Um, I mean, what's really different about the center I'm approaching is uh, it would be locally fo focused on local issues here, uh, Asian carp that we're facing, the common carp, the zebra mussel. Now, uh, University of Notre Dame, as far as I know, doesn't have any work going on zebra mussel control. It wouldn't be in their mission statement. Uh, they're not a public university. Um, um, so that would be one really major difference. As far as duplication goes, uh, I think one advantage of putting this to an academic institution is that we are under pressure to publish all the time, and you can't publish something twice. So, I mean, just from a practical side, uh, I have no, I, no reason for the life of me to try and just do something that somebody else has done again. That's not interesting to me. I receive absolutely no rewards from it. It doesn't benefit you either. So uh, there's plenty of really interesting and important work to be done. And, um, uh, you know, that's what I'd look to do. And uh, I think if you speak with the DNR, I mean, that's what I would hope this group, if this center gets formed, it would actively be working with the DNR. I would hope, frankly, that there'd even be a DNR position embedded within it. And that we would, uh, we would be at the forefront in this country and um, trying to protect Minnesota before it's too late. It's not too late here. We're a little bit late, but it's not too late. It's too late in, uh, in Illinois. It's not too late here. They're, they're Asian carp, all right. At least there's DNA. But there isn't a breeding population. It's not too late. So it's just time, time to do something. And uh, that's, uh, if we don't do it, I don't see, the federal government is focused on stopping them from getting through to Lake Michigan, uh, not in protecting Minnesota, not in actually even controlling or reducing Asian carp in, uh, in Minnes you know, Mississippi waters. That's not their goal. It's to protect uh, Great Lakes. Thank you, Dr. Sorensen. Follow up, Representative Hacker. Uh, one last thing. So, Dr. Sorensen, so you would look at what uh, Notre Dame's done as far as eDNA? Oh, of course. And, and use that and, and not duplicate that and move beyond that? Dr. Sorensen. Oh, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Representative uh, Draskowski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Dr. Sorensen, uh, you've talked about kind of some of the things that we can learn about these, these species. Uh, I, I'm kind of wondering, well, you know, in areas where these carp have already infiltrated, so what? But in areas that they haven't, it seems that we've got kind of two different issues. One is, one is how do we keep them out of waters that they haven't gotten into? Once they're infested, uh, I mean, is it reason? What is our goal at that point? Is it reasonable to believe we're going to uh, remove them from those particular waters, or? Uh, I'd be interested in your comments, Ron. No, Dr. Dr. Sorensen, and then could you also just quickly talk about how you've uh, put the tracking devices and that's helped you in cases where there's high population? Sure. Dr. Sorensen. So, so you're right that, that there's, there's multiple things going on here. There's, there's trying to prevent something from coming in. I mean, it's, I, I often look at medical technology, you know, so you, you want to uh, inoculate people or or survey populations to make sure diseases aren't coming to the U.S. when you cross the border. It's the same thing, but if it's here, do uh, you just give up on it? Is it hopeless? No. I mean, uh, and um, you just adopt a different approach. 
and you, you adopt one that's targeted to control, and, and you start working on it. And uh, um, I, I guess uh, I would just ask to comment. So for instance, on Common Carp, one of the things w we found was that uh, we're using what's called the Judas Fish approach, which was initially developed in Australia, actually. And we found that uh, we put radio tags in these fish, and we follow them across large-scale landscapes. And we found what appeared to be random is actually quite organized, and that they form very distinct aggregations in the middle of the winter. I still don't know why exactly, but for instance, uh, Lake Riley, one of the areas we worked in, there was 4,500 carp there. The average carp was 20 years old. The people in that lake have been suffering with poor water quality, couldn't even sleep at night because there were so many carp feeding and eating. But they were all 20 years old. So what we found was that they all aggregated every winter in one area about the size of a football field. And once we found that, we hired a commercial fisherman one afternoon, they were out of there. So sometimes, uh, you know, you find these things. So I guess I'm saying you have to start uh, doing, following a couple tracks, uh, prevention, detection and prevention, and also control and mitigation. And uh, I would... I don't want to give up on an environment, and uh, I don't think it's necessary. There are solutions. Uh, sometimes they're a little harder to come by. Does, does it kind of answer your question? So, you know, so as we try to stop Asian carp, that was my one last point, or zebra mussel from spreading any further, we should be simultaneously realizing that's a temporary deterrent and, and looking for things to deal with it once they've reached those walls. And, um, but uh, the sooner we start looking, the better. There are things that might just take a little while to find, but we'll, we can find them. Dr. Sorensen, I appreciate your willingness to stick around. Members, just to let you know, there are a few things on our agenda that we are not going to do. We are going to skip, uh, we've let DNR know, we're going to skip the walkthrough of the DNR's AIS bill, um, including the uh, presentation they have, the long-term funding AIS report. Um, both of those are, I believe, available online or will be, and they're in the packet and for the audience. Um, so I would encourage folks to look at those going forward. Representative Wagenius, I think we're going to end up having to hold off on your House File 1644, which is the uh, um, AIS uh, surcharge fee on boats. And we will move into uh, Representative Hackbart's uh, House file 1809 after we get done with Dr. Sorensen. I'm not cutting off the discussion with Dr. Sorensen now, but I want to let people know um, we need to have the discussion of uh, this issue of Dr. Sorensen, Representative Leginius's House file 1963, and then Representative Hackbart's bill because they will be some of the very first things we'll be dealing with uh, when this committee meets again. Um, next, I have um, Representative Fabian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Dr. Sorensen, for being here. I'd like to do a little segue from uh, Representative Han Hackbarth's question and also what uh, Representative Wagenius said. She talked about bringing the best and the brightest here to Minnesota to tackle this problem. Um, I guess one of the things that I'm also concerned about is, is do we have people right here in Minnesota that can fill those positions, obviously? And, and, and then how do you bring people up to speed with regards to, you know, where do you start in, in this <laughs> whole thing? I mean, to me, it's like, how do you build a house? You start with the foundation. What's your foundation? Now, other than the equipment that you need, then where does the study actually start, and how do you perceive that moving forward? Dr. Sorensen. Okay. Um, great question. Um, I, so we do have a solid base here. I, I think uh, Minnesota has a solid national and international reputation uh, for work on invasive species. Um, uh, but we could use use more help. But we already have, uh, beside myself, we have uh, Dr. Ray Newman. We have a, a, a research associate working with me, Dr. Beyer, who's been working here six, seven years now. We've been publishing. We're known. Uh, so uh, we have a foundation. Uh, we have some people working in DNA. Uh, so there's some people working in invasive insects and things like that and, and plants. So Minnesota, it's, there's a place to start. Um, how do you then sort of pick up speed, I guess, is, is the question. Um, and uh, I think in my experience, a really productive way was actually to start working with local watersheds and DNRs. So when I started in 2003, we started going out to different watersheds and working and seeing exactly what the problems were. And then, frankly, we've been funded by a lot of them now. It's been very helpful. So we get out there and, uh, and work with them. And I found... Uh, 
lots and lots of volunteers. Uh, everyone seems really anxious. Uh, it's just been amazing to me, frankly. Uh, when we go out in the lakes, people come out and bring us coffee, and people are just so happy to see something happening that it just uh, kind of builds. I is it. So we'd bring, create a couple new positions at the university, give them some facilities. I've got lots of connections, particularly with local watershed districts. I, I know where zebra mussel problems are. I know where uh, problems are with, with various plants. I, and I have great connections, I think, with the DNR. Uh, we know where the carp are. I have connections now with um, the Mississippi River Panel for the National Aquatic Nuisance Species Task Force. I know all the Asian carp people. I pretty much know how to plug in. I, guess I'm getting older <laughs> and I don't think I've gotten too many people mad at me so I think we have a pretty good way to move forward you know uh, in some kind of systematic fashion follow-up representative Fabian thank you mr. chair and then finally uh, um, your attention to this problem is, is I mean are you going to have are you having multiple studies going on or is it your anticipation that that this is going to be the focus of your laser beam as we move forward after this program becomes funded dr. Sorensen um, so I not quite sure I understood your question but, but clarification representative Fabian. thank you mr. chair yeah. I'm just wondering are you going to be continuing with other studies or is this going to be your sole job I'll say dr. Sorensen oh that's a great question Dr. Sorensen, he's asking if you want to take on the opportunity to yeah, I know. a solution <laughs> to this problem. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's a little, little daunting. I have, I, I have to talk with the university about that. I would be willing to do it if they give me a little bit of break in teaching and so forth because it's a pretty serious commitment. But, yes, I'm interested in it for sure if the opportunity's right. D Dr. Sorensen, I've got Representative Knuth next. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Dr. Sorensen, and um, appreciate you being here and uh, talking about the opportunities the university can bring in terms of bringing in uh, world-class researchers and applying them to problems in, in Minnesota. And I, I kind of have a two-pronged question. One is just reiterating what other species or types of ecosystems you'd be working on. We've been talking a lot about carp, and I think carp are clearly important, but they're by no means the only oh, yeah. um, uh, species and you know we've got the zebra mussel or the spiny water flea or in Lake Michigan they have the round goby you know you can go right. down the list of various things and I'm curious how you see this center the the scientists working together on sort of broader species and interactions and that sort of thing um, and then also uh, how you see it you know, the university has both a you know, broader research mission but also a, the land grant mission and how you see those two balancing with sort of the, the broader research agenda mm -hmm. and then the land grant mission of, of being on the ground here in, in Minnesota. Well, I'll, I'll answer the, Dr. Sorensen. The, the last question first. Um, I think it's absolutely, imp well, I'd be, it would be folly if, if this center didn't have a full-time extension person. Uh, it, this would broaden the university's land-grant mission and be part of it. Um, and uh, I, so that is how we'd, we'd, we'd work with uh, uh, getting that information out there because it's applied research. If it's not applied, it's just kind of stupid, frankly. So at least that's my perspective. It's my point in my life. So that, that's, uh, I'd want a, a full-time person to do nothing and work with the DNR maybe more even you know so that would be that the other question is how does this disparate group seemingly disparate group work together um, were there a couple at least in my plan there were a couple positions that would tie everybody together and one was um, that uh, this did the see a key to uh, controlling and understanding invasive species is just knowing how many there are that's really hard right now I mean it's really it's like uh, sampling Asian carp in the river is like running around your lawn blindfolded with a net trying to catch a squirrel or something. They're, they could be all in the trees, but you'll never get them because they're smart and they see you coming and they swim away. And that's kind of the situation. So we have to develop tools, but these tools could be used uh, if we'd be focusing on molecular and, and supplementing and, and amplifying the work that started at Notre Dame, I would hope, um, would, would be... A, these molecular tools be equally applicable to zebra mussel as to Asian carp. It wouldn't just be Asian carp. So that would tie people together. Uh, 
there'd be a statistician to help guide the decisions to make sure that they were done in appropriate and efficient manners, and that would tie people together. Then, of course, we'd be sharing ecosystems together. So uh, zebra mussel, like carp, and right now, the situation with Asian carp is quite different because they're not, they're here, but they're not back. We're just trying to deter right now. But the uh, common carp and the zebra mussel and the invasive plants are all found in the same ecosystem at the same time. And that's what my lab has found over the last, you can't deal with one if you don't deal with the others. It's all part of the same system. So we, we I think we'd all be working together on this. That uh, particularly if we're working through uh, local watersheds and DNR uh, study lakes and things like that, like I mentioned before. Um, that's why we got into phosphorus. We found we couldn't, couldn't control carp without addressing phosphorus. So we sort of just kind of happened. But uh, it's a natural, it's a natural thing. Thank you, Dr. Sorensen. Thank you for coming in. I, oh, I'm just going to have one last, just a real small yeah. question. Um, do you think if we properly fund, and I don't know how you define properly fund the research component, should we also think about putting barriers in the lock and dam to uh, <laughs> it's something that no other state's been willing to do? Do you think that would be a good idea for the state of Minnesota? Dr. Sorensen. Yeah, well, I guess. Um, Was your answer yes? Because we could just end right now. <laughs> <laughs> No, oh, Dr. Sorensen. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, in addition, so I, I think um, there's a real risk that these things are, you know, they're coming upstream. I think a strategically placed uh, barrier or two as a temporary deterrent delay system while we buy time with the research would be a judicious move. And um, the way I look at it is. Um, you don't want to be kicking yourself 20 years from now because you just didn't do something that, that's that simple. Um, and I'm not saying put them all over the place in ways that are incredibly expensive and unlikely, but a couple well-placed barriers to buy us a little time uh, seems to me to be, uh, that's what I would do. Thank you, Dr. Sorensen. Thank you for coming in. We appreciate it. Was there any final comments, Representative Wagenius? Then I was going to move into the next item. Representative Wagenius. Yes, like a couple of things I want to uh, talk to you about. First of all, Dr. Sorensen does have a formal presentation that he gave to LOHC. It's on my computer and uh, I'm going to make sure that I send it around as soon as I get back up to my office. That's one thing. A second thing, embedded in his figures is a lot of stuff that ought to be bonded for. And that hasn't been sorted out. And I, I will commit to you that uh, I'll, I'll work with him and some folks at the U to figure out what if this is bondable and what has to be spent in cash. And I suspect a lot of that, uh, a lot more than you think, is bondable. That's just my reading of that. Can't guarantee anything. Um, the, the final thing I would like to say is, um, I am a huge advocate of funding this, so that's obvious. And uh, funding his vision, my thought is that this is not a uh, normal year. I mean, this is not a budget year. But we do have money within water, and we have it in uh, heritage, that we could appropriate enough money for Dr. Sorensen, enough money for at least two or three, uh, my, two or three folks that would be new, because he said we need some new people in this proposal, some new people, and some people at the U who will be working on this, uh, who are already working on it. Uh, and then next year, we can do it all over again. So some money can come, so the U could figure out what to apply for for LCCMR, for waters and for uh, heritage. So within these two years, I think we can get the job done. And we can fund it out for the six or eight years. It would not be a recurring thing that we would have to come back and fund uh, year after year because I, I don't think it works. I don't think Dr. Sorensen thinks it works. But we could do the six years uh, and fund it as one individual one-time appropriations. Thank you, Representative Wigenius. Thank you, Dr. Sorensen. We look forward to continuing to work with you. Next members, we're going to hear uh, from Representative Hackbart, 
um, and I believe you have a testifier representative Hackbart. It's House File 1809. Um, members, just to uh, reiterate what Representative Wagenius was talking about, currently Lassard Sams has a recommendation. They modified it at their last meeting uh, to allocate uh, five and a half million um, uh, to the uh, aquatic invasive species issue. It's uh, fairly broad uh, at this point, their recommendation. There is additional money available in clean water uh, legacy money that we did not. It's gotten to be a little bit more money available on the bottom line there than was thought last year. Um, but from uh, Representative Torkelson's line of questioning about clean water money, uh, AIS would be a new direction that that money historically has not gone for things like that. That's not to say that there aren't many of us that support that idea of looking at that, but that's a, a discussion that we'll need to have going forward. Then Representative Wigenius also talked about LCCMR. LCCMR last year, members in special session, we approved their two-year budget, and so only would it be if there's some cancel backs or some reprioritizing or funding from different sources or literally the cancellation of projects that would be unfortunate to go down that road of canceling something that's in the middle of the works. So those are the different funding sources we've talked about. And so that's what will be uh, before us on that to this point. Representative Hansen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'm wondering before our next meeting if maybe Mr. Reinholz could bring the committee um, the history of how much money has been spent specifically in the Clean Water Fund on research. I know that we've funded in a couple bienniums research uh, that's being conducted at the Minnesota Department of Agriculture. So if we could uh, see the precedent and how much has been funded there, I think that would be helpful for the committee to look at that precedent. And, and that, that's a great idea, Representative Hanson. Why don't we ask Mr. Reinholz to expand on that and confirm with Mr. Becker at Lassard Sam's and Clean Water how much is actually on the bottom line. Uh, uh, understanding they both have goals to keep a, a, a certain amount, a, a flexible amount, but at least some working capital for uh, so that their checkbook doesn't bounce, uh, so to speak. Um, and then uh, to confirm with uh, Ms. Thornton on what uh, is actually available, the limited uh, possibilities in LCCMR. Um, well, re welcome. Re any other thoughts on that at this point? Thank you. Um, and thanks for the good questions with Dr. Sorensen. Um, uh, welcome, Representative Hackbart. Um, uh, please present the informational hearing on House File 1809. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members, uh, uh, House File 1809 is a fish barrier bill. Uh, it uh, uh, would install electric fish barriers at three different lock and dams uh, along the Mississippi River. It would be lock and dam uh, two, one, and at the Upper St. Anthony Falls. And uh, uh, the chairman and I were at the last uh, governor's roundtable or task force meeting or whatever it was that uh, the DNR made a presentation and, and the governor was there and we heard uh, from the Army Corps of Engineers and uh, I took from that that this is a very, very urgent and uh, uh, almost an emergency status that we have to get something in place right away uh, to stop these Asian carp should they be coming north. And uh, so I uh, wrote this bill. And uh, it's just to get our foot in the door. It's very, very basic. But uh, uh, you will see in the presentation, I have with me today uh, Mr. Jeff Griffith, Griffin that is going to make a presentation. I'm not going to take up a lot of your time because his presentation uh, is what we really need to see. And hopefully we'll hear uh, testimony from the, uh, uh, the public testimony that we have uh, lined up to. But uh, uh, it's, it's for about $13 million to put these uh, electric fish barriers in these three different locations. And uh, Mr. Griffin will show you exactly what we're talking about and uh, how effective they are and the history behind electric fish barriers. This is for the very most modern technology that we have to stop these Asian carp coming north. And uh, with that, Mr. Uh, Chairman, uh, I would like you to introduce uh, Mr. Jeff Griffin. Thank you, Mr. Griffin. If you could identify yourself for the record and who you're with and then go ahead with your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Jeffrey G. Griffin. I'm the CEO of G-Cubed Engineering in Chatfield, Minnesota.
my machine got sleeping from, from Mr. Sorensen's presentation. I have a bachelor's degree in civil engineering from North Dakota State University with an emphasis in water resource engineering. I have a master's degree in civil engineering from the University of Minnesota, St. Anthony Falls Hydraulic Lab. I have an MBA from the University of St. Thomas in town here. For 10 years, I was the hydraulic and hydrologic engineer for the Department of Natural Resources Bureau of Engineering. While at the DNR there, I designed numerous electrical fish barriers, mechanical fish barriers, um, slope and culverts, hydraulic barriers, um, water control structures, um, pretty much that was my expertise. Uh, Twelve years ago I went on my own at G-Cubed Engineering. While at G-Cubed uh, I worked in numerous consultant jobs for the DNR, for Bowser, Ducks Unlimited, Minnesota Waterfall, Trout Unlimited. Um, in that capacity designed numerous fish barriers all over the state and uh, all over the Midwest. Some of the slides I give you, you're, you're looking at with the GGG in the upper left. The date, the date isn't wrong here. It's, it's February 27, 2002. In 2002, the DNR hired me to come to their fishery conference and give their fishery staff a, a presentation on fish barriers and fish barrier design. During that presentation, I talked about the three main barriers in Minnesota. The first is hydraulic barrier. That's the simplest and the cheapest. If, Essentially, if you have enough hydraulic drop, like a dam or a, or a slope and culvert, you can just stop the fish and it doesn't cost you any money. There's no electricity, there's no maintenance. Um, you know, essentially a fish can jump, a carp can jump six to seven feet, and so if during a hundred year event you keep the tailwater and the headwater uh, more than seven feet apart, they can't get through. It's a real simple barrier on smaller watersheds you can take a culvert and slope it enough so the velocities are such in the culvert so the fish can't pass. A mechanical fit barrier is essentially screens, where you put screens across the channel. It's more used in a small system. Uh, it, it's, it's a lot of times used to maybe protect a wetland where you stop the, the big ones from getting through, but the little ones will get through. However, a lot of the wetlands, the winter kill, so the, the little ones never become big ones. And so as Peter Sorensen talked about, you don't get the big ones in a wetland burrowing in the mud and ruining the uh, turbidity. The third thing is electrical fish barriers. In situations in Minnesota where it's flat, where you don't have the vertical drop, the best way typically has always been to put electrical fish barrier in and that 100% stops the fish from getting through. Uh, I got involved with this particular project only a couple months ago. I read in my local paper a letter to the editor uh, from numerous, numerous fisheries groups talking about their concerns with the DNR's proposal for bubble and sound barriers. Back when I gave my presentation 10 years ago, um, bubble and sound barriers didn't even exist. So I did some research. I called the DNR, asked for some sources for their data, because they talked about pretty high percentages of stopping these fish from going through with a bubbler and sound system. When you actually look at the data, all of this testing was done either in a, in a hatchery raceway or in a channel that's only three feet deep. Well, there's a big difference between putting an air system at the bottom of a, of a three-foot deep hatchery raceway or a three-foot deep body of water and dealing with the Minnesota or Mississippi River where we have 30 feet plus of water during flood times. Um, there's no data regarding what would happen if you're trying to put a bubbler down 30 feet below its impact um, in, in that sort of column of water. The other thing that struck me real seriously was the fact that none of the research was done in the spring of the year when the uh, carp are trying to migrate. The carp, you know, during the majority of the year, they're just kind of hanging around. But in the spring, when they're wanting to go upstream and spawn, they're real persistent little rascals. And they'll just go and go and go. And uh, to me, the research has to be done at that time. Otherwise, your data really is skewed. I know at a recent carp summit, uh, uh, you know, it's stated that they feel that uh, these systems in a, this situ type of situation on the Minnesota or Mississippi would be more like 60% effective. To me, if you're going to let 40% through, you just will put your money into a habitat and work on the habitat upstream so that native species can fight off these guys versus letting, putting in a system that lets 30 or 40% through. 
This is a picture of electric fish ferry I put in the early 90s. This is actually in Lake Christina, up by between Alexandria and Fergus Falls. This was to protect a, a very high end a waterfall lake. And uh, it, in talking with the DNR officials, they feel to this day there's not been one fish that has ever passed through this barrier. Now, Christina does get repopulated with carp, but that's because they can't kill the 100% with rope known. What they do is they try to rope known the lake, get rid of the carp so they can start from scratch. But according to the DNR staff, it's just really hard in that particular instance with the little pockets and stuff all over to get 100% kill. And so it does get repopulated with carp, but they are not coming through the barrier. The next installation is in here in Lake in southwestern Minnesota. I put this in, in the middle 90s. This is real similar to what I'm going to be proposing with you in the lock and dams. This channel is about 80 foot wide, about 15 feet deep on a, on a 100 year event, and uh, we 100% stop the uh, fish from uh, passing through the, this, at this installation. Here's another picture of here in Lake just from a different view. Essentially what you see is you have seven electrodes running across. They go down the sides, go across the bottom of the channel, and we use DC pulsating power. Essentially what happens, the further the fish swim, the more they get. So it starts out with a tingle, they keep going further and further. By the time they get to the upper end, they eventually get stiff, their muscles go numb, current takes them down, they come to, and in the spring of the year when they really want to go, they try again, and, and it's just an iterative cycle. In the spring of the year at this installation, like I said, it's about 80 foot wide channel, you know, for hundreds and hundreds of feet downstream, it's just black covered with carp when they're wanting to come up and, and move upstream and spawn. I think this structure was funded by the LCCMR back at the day. Here's the lock and dams that we're talking about. In the upper left is the upper St. Anthony Falls, and then we go down to lock and dam one. Both of those are on the Mississippi. <clears throat> Further down, we have Lock and Dam 2, which is on the Minnesota and Mississippi. I looked brief briefly at the St. Croix and talking with some DNR staff at Echo Services. They actually feel that the St. Croix, there, there's characteristics in the St. Croix that do not make that very good habitat for the uh, silver carp or the Asian carp. And so that really wasn't uh, their highest concern in protecting the St. Croix because they feel that because the hydraulic conductivity of the water there, that they're never going to be a, a major place for them to reproduce. <clears throat> Here's just a typical lock barrier. You have to the left the upper lock, and then to the right the lower lock. What we're looking at doing is putting an electrical field below the lower lock. And so it's a real simple system. It's not on all the time. It's only on when, when the boats come. You, I'm going to explain that further here. Here's a blow up of it. Essentially what we're going to do below the lower lock, we're going to have to take the existing concrete walls, we're going to have to remove those and put new concrete. And the reason is we got to use insulative concrete and we also need to use a, a fiberglass rebar versus metallic rebar. That way uh, all the electrical current stays in the water and doesn't get grounded to the ground. So essentially we remove the concrete, put new concrete in, we embed electrodes in it just like we did it here in Lake and run a barrier. Essentially what we do, when a boat comes up and the lockmaster turns it on, it herds all the fish out of the area. Once the fish are herded out of the area, they open the, uh, open the gates and go. Here's a little uh, detail of the lock sequence. Default state on the left, you have high water on the left, low water on the right. Go to number two, you see a boat approaching. The black arrow is my boat. The boat's approaching. Go to number three. The lock master activates the barrier. Sees the boat coming, he, act he or she activates the barrier, herds the fish out of there. Once the fish are out of there, they uh, open the lower gate, let the boat in. The boat passes through in number five there. Once the boat's passed through, he or she, the lock master locks the lower uh, lock, and uh, once the lower lock is locked, they can uh, shut the power back off and resume normal operation there. Safety, I want to talk briefly on safety. A lot of people get thinking about, boy, you're electrifying the water, what's that going to do? Um, these DC pulsating barriers are non-lethal. I personally at the Heron Lake was out there doing some fine tuning, uh, slipped into the water. It, it's a tingle, but it, it's not lethal. Um, it's important to know that it, it, it's uh, AC, your standard AC is three times more uh, harm to a human body than DC. Um, 
the DNR folks have been dealing with these DC for years. I mean, uh, the same manufacturer that manufactures the pulsators for these manufacture the DNR's electrofishing boats. And so the DNR staff are out with these metallic boats and doing electrofishing all the time. And numerous times a day, they get a tingle, do something wrong, and, and get their hand in the water, and they get a tingle. They're at about five times more of the power than what we are here, and uh, we've never had a problem. Other people have brought up, you know, how do you deal with barges going through? This same system is what's in the Chicago Canal, and uh, and they they're running through numerous barges an hour in the, and uh, no harm to the barge, no harm to the operators or workers in the barge. Um, in our case, it, this is a lot more a controlled and uh, safe system than than a normal barrier like at here in Lake, which is on 24/7. That barrier's on, never shuts off except real low flow when the fish aren't, aren't in the area. But uh, in our case, as I previously stated, the electric field is controlled by the lock master. And so that field only runs when a boat comes and they're going to open the gate and let a boat pass through. Once that boat is passed through and the gates are shut, this is off. Additionally, you always have, the with the lock master running it, you have added protection that should there be an incident where you have a boater and they jump out of the boat into the current, they can shut it off. You got a person there 24-7 running the lock, and so you always have that as a, uh, a fuse plug in case of emergency or someone exhibits bad judgment. Lastly, in these lock and barrier, and where we're proposing these, you, the boaters have the option of going around. I mean, there, there's access points, so they can put their boat in different places if they absolutely do not feel comfortable going through uh, electric barrier at a lock operation. I want to start with lock and dam number one. If you remember right, I talked about the most effective barrier system in the world is a hydraulic system. On lock and dam number one, the reason I chose this one is the, the head difference between the upper pool and the lower pool is 35 feet. And so with 35 feet, even on the 1965 flood, the flood of record, it was 15 feet differential, and so they, they can't jump through. And so the majority of this entire system shown on your screen is 100% protected 100% of the time. It's just the lock chamber is the only place that isn't protected. So if we would take that 50-foot lock chamber, put electrical barrier downstream of it, activate that barrier whenever the, the gates flow open up, we got 100% barrier at this situation. It's just, it's like a textbook thing. I mean, uh, it, it's easy to put in. It, it's uh, um, easy to manage, and like I said, you don't have to worry about the remaining, uh, 100, you know, 500 feet of channel width of the of the Mississippi because that is covered with a hydraulic barrier. Construction costs about three and a half million dollars. Would that that covers the entire lock barrier? It also covers putting electrical barrier. There's a couple tubes in the dam that uh, that we'd have to electrify also, so the fish don't go through the tubes. The annual operating cost for electricity is $3,500. Uh, what I did there is I called the lock master, found out that in 2011 they, uh, they opened that gate 2,113 times. He said on the average the gates open 20 minutes at a time. And so we took the uh, 2,113 times 20 minutes and I know how much electricity it costs and, and uh, put this together. Uh, the other barriers in the state, the DNR has typically purchase an annual maintenance contract where the uh, manufacturer of the equipment would come out once a year and test it, make sure the field's all tests okay, um, checks all the equipment over, and uh, they felt that's a value. And so I put in, I called the manufacturer and found out what, what they would charge for a uh, maintenance agreement on this barrier here. St. Anthony Falls is almost a dead ringer to, uh, to uh, Lock and Dam 1. Uh, the, the lock, once again, 50 foot wide. Um, about 30 foot deep column of water we have to electrify. The rest of the spillway, there's no problem. Even on a 100 year event, they cannot get around it. Um, this one even has a little more vertical drop. And so it's really almost identical situation. Same cost, 3.5 million, 3,500 a year to run it. Um, get down to Lock and Dam 2, which uh, Lock and Dam 2 is important because if you get to Lock and Dam 2, you're protecting the Mississippi and the Minnesota. You understand Lock and Upper St. Anthony Falls and Lock and Dam 1, you're only protecting the Mississippi. Lock and Dam 2, the, the difference between Lock and Dam 2 and the other two is the red section on your picture going across the river. 
By that I mean during flood times, and I'm going to define that. I, in talking with the DNR, they feel it's a, somewhere between a seven and ten year event on average that the tailwater is going to get high enough. There's only 12 feet of hydraulic head difference between the up above this and below it. And so keep in mind, about six or seven feet, uh, a carp can jump. And so during flood events, that tailwater comes up and, and gets so they can scoot through it. And like I said, in talking with the DNR, it appears like that's somewhere between a seven, ten year event. So essentially, by putting a lock barrier in only here, we have it protected you know, 90% 90, 90 of the time, but if we get a, a major flood, if we get a flood event, tailwater's going to come up and they're going to be able to go around and go over the major spillway here. And so at lock and dam number two, I'm, uh, there's just a, a photo of it that may help. In the, in the lower right, you see the, uh, the numerous tainer gates, and that's the section that during flood events, they'd be able to go through. In the, in the upper left, you see the, uh, the lock. And th in this case, it's a larger lock. It's 110 foot wide versus 50 at the other ones, but uh, real similar installation. Construction cost for the lock barrier itself is six million. The reason it went from three and a half to six is we went from a, a 50 foot wide to 110 foot wide lock chamber. Annual, annual operating cost is 6,100. Uh, once again, this is based on real data. They had more, more. Um, transportation through 2893 and then of course it's also a, uh, a larger area to electrify. I also gave a second proposal here to put what I call a, a high flow barrier and that is one to go across the rest of that spillway. So, so during flood times, so, so the lock master would have two things going. During, uh, during normal times you would turn the barrier on just like you do at the other two only when a, a boat's going to pass. The other situation that would kick in here would be we get five inches of rain, tail water comes up, they kick on the rest of it to protect the entire um, rest of the spillway so no fish can pass through during that time. Keep in mind that's real expensive, um, but it's only run you know, you know, once every uh, seven to 10 years, according to DNR data. It costs $36,000 a month to run to electrify that entire section. But like I said, it's not run very often. With that, I'm here to entertain any questions. Questions, members? <laughs> Representative Dill. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Mr. Griffin, so <clears throat> you're saying that this is a 100% stop when installed? 100% stop. Mr. Griffin. I, I, I'm sorry. Mr. Chair, Representative Dill, um, you know, maybe nothing's 100% because you always have people that uh, fishermen that uh, decide to take one and haul it up or you have bait buckets and stuff but as far as the barrier they're not going to get through my barrier it's done I put this in it's done follow up representative deal additional questions Representative, I'm sorry <clears throat> representative Hanson thank you mr. chair uh, again for something for mr. Reinholds to do uh, check on the bondability of electric barriers if uh, these are able to be paid for through capital investments and then also on the Coon Rapids Dam how specific that appropriation is for bonding if it's specific for the Coon Rapids Dam or if that money could be repurposed uh, for barriers such as this. Okay. Um, uh, thank you. Um, uh, Representative Deal. Well I don't have a question. I, I'm, I'm really addressing the committee. Uh, it would certainly seem that this qualifies for bonding uh, I mean, it's a capital asset of the state, but <clears throat> I've heard in here several times today that we are behind the power curve in a big way. I mean, if if there's if there's any opportunity to get this done uh, earlier than later, it won't be with bonding dollars. Um, bonding dollars make the most sense to me, but this needs to be accelerated. I mean, I, I feel like it needs to be done like almost under an emergency order. You know, around my companies, something happens like this, and we say we're doing it right now. Uh, I know state government doesn't work like that, but that's what I feel like is we are under right now. Like there should be some emergency power that says this has to be done to protect the resources of the state. So I'm all for bonding, but bonding isn't going to happen until what August 1st. The money, you know, we sell the bonds, and then we have to have engineering and. You have to have construction season, and you've got 2,800 boats going through this particular 
uh, <clears throat> facility, and it just causes a whole lot of things. I mean, it, that's my concern with bonding, although I think it's a great bonding project. Um, good point, Representative Dill. Um, additional comments, Representative Hackbart? Otherwise, I was going to ask the DNR to come down. Okay, I, I do have just a, a couple other Representative comments. Hackbart. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as far as the bonding is concerned, uh, I, I do agree that it is bondable. And if we look at the uh, at the Hastings site uh, to uh, put that $20 million barrier across the entire dam, that probably makes sense. Uh, we can do that for long term. We can uh, propose that in bonding. But this is an emergency. And uh, this uh, three-eighths of 1% money that uh, the voters passed, uh, I think this is what they expect us to do with that kind of money, especially in a situation like this. Uh, when the folks know exactly the urgency of this and to protect the resource that we have in the state of Minnesota, we need to do this now. And we have funds available through uh, Lassard Sands. This only makes sense. It's $13 million to do the three sites, um, $20 million to do the, the dam at Hastings, bond for that. But $13 million, uh, there's matching money that we can get from uh, uh, federal money from the DOT. That's $4 million. Uh, so uh, you reduce that. That's We're looking at $9 million from Lassard Sands. That's what we need to get this project done, and we can get it done. We can be smart, and, and I think the people will be uh, very, very happy with uh, us doing that. Um, uh, at, at the at the DNR roundtable, uh, we heard over and over again about uh, redundancy, and it makes sense to put these at th those three spots to protect these in all the all these three different areas. Uh, I think there's a lot of people that are concerned about the Minnesota River. Uh, put that at Hastings. Some people don't want to put it at Hastings, but I think it makes absolute sense to protect both the Mississippi and the Minnesota River at Hastings. We need to move forward with that six million dollar project there. Uh, uh, one more thing, uh, uh, there's folks that are here that were uh, on LCCMR and took a tour uh, of uh, uh, some wind farms a number of years ago, and we stopped by Heron Lake and we seen that facility. I don't know if uh, you were with uh, Representative Wagenius on that trip or not, but we did actually stop and check this uh, uh, fish barrier out at that time. So with that, Mr. Chair, I'm done, and uh, you can bring uh, the DNR up. I don't know if uh, Mr. Griffin has any final comments or not. Um, uh uh, Representative Hackbart, just to your point where it looks like we potentially are looking for somewhere in the neighborhood of $9 million of, of state money because of the potential federal match, which we're not 100% yet guaranteed that it would be there. They're, the MnDOT is trying to run by the feds. Uh, they're very interested. That money is only available, uh, the federal money through MnDOT is only available when we protect uh, the top two locks, uh, the St. Anthony and uh, money spent at uh, uh, Lock and Dam number one because uh, they feel that would qualify to uh, by um, putting in a, um, electric barriers or some kind of barrier at both Lock and Dams, it would really ensure uh, that the locks would be able to stay open and it would keep a whole lot of truck traffic off the road uh, where if we have to close St. Anthony to protect the upper Mississippi, there's significant commerce moves through that lock and dam and the traffic on the roads and such would be unbelievable. So that's where they're coming from in the protection. Uh, they can't justify the, the federal money being spent because Hastings does potentially lock and dam to overflow at, at a given time. Now, we didn't have the discussion uh, in regards to Hastings if we went the full blowing. I, I don't know about that. But, but there, the federal uh, match is a a significant match. They only need a million dollars of uh, non-federal money to match potentially the four million available. And then, Representative Hackbart, you talked about Lassard Sam's being the full source of the nine million. <coughs> I just wanted to clarify: Are you open to the idea that other legacy money, like clean water, which potentially is there, could fund part of uh, your proposal? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, yes, absolutely. I'm open to that uh, wherever we can get the money, but I think it is an emergency situation. Uh, if we can take some from Lassard Sam's, if it's available through clean water, that would be great too. However we can make that work, we have to do it. Okay, thank you. Uh, Representative Torkelson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a couple quick questions for Mr. Griffin. One, you described the uh, installation as uh, replacing the cement walls along the sides. Uh, are these uh, cement walls subject to uh, vulnerable to physical damage? Representative, I'm sorry, Mr. Gibbon. 
Mr. Chair, Chair no, Representative I'm Torgelson. Uh, no, I mean, th this, uh, to my, the best of my knowledge, this, the smallest lock is 50 foot wide. You have a lock master right there. It, it isn't a situation where you have bolts ramming into the sides. And so well, once we put the, you know, remove the wall, put the new insulcrete in and the uh, fiberglass reinforcing and the electrodes in, are we going to have problems with it getting smashed up and being ineffective? No, I, in my opinion, and no, that's not the case. Well, follow up, Representative oh, Parkle. Thank you, Mr. Griffin. We do know that people do run into things. I'm not, uh, <laughs> it happens. But uh, uh, another quick question. Uh, if we would put this on a fast track, uh, what kind of timeline do you believe would be involved in getting this up and running? Mr. Griffin. Uh, once again, Mr. Chair and Representative Torgelson, uh, the construction portion is about, a, is about uh, two to three months uh, process. More importantly is the permitting. You know, once I need to work with the Corps of Engineers, uh, most likely I would recommend that I'll bring in some folks from the uh, Chicago Corps, which we worked with on the uh, Chicago Canal electric barrier, bring them in to educate the St. Paul District of the Corps on electric barriers and, and, uh, and their benefits. Might even have to bring in John Coase from President Obama's administration, who is a CARP czar. But, uh, but you know, we have permitting issues with the Corps of Engineers. We're going to have to get their blessing and incorporate this in their operating plan, and then we have to get through the construction cycle. To be honest with you, um, there's probably, if we put it off too far, the funding, and you don't get going on the engineering, there's a chance you'll miss putting it in, in next winter. Representative Torkelson, follow up. Thank you. Just one more uh, issue. Uh, to your knowledge, Mr. Griffin, how close are these fish to uh, pounding on the door, shall we say? Mr. Griffin. I, I'm not the expert in that. All I, would, all I know there is what I've read in, uh, in Outdoor News and other publications. I'm an engineer, not a biologist. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Representative Kwong. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Griffin, uh, can all these be done? I know the permitting and that stuff can be done in parallel, but is there a capacity to do all three projects construction in parallel with the ex, you know, expertise and materials? And if not, um, can we do two of them? Mr. Griffin. To answer your question, in this economic climate, there will be no problem building all three at once. There's a lot of contractors looking for work. This is general concrete work, um, nothing. With the proper supervision, we can get this implemented. Uh, follow. Oh, okay, Representative Scott. My question is already asked. Yes. Thank you, Representative Wagenius. Yes. Uh, thanks. A couple of questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I I actually like the lock and dam two, and the lock and dam one makes sense to me. But if the lock and dam one is a hundred percent effective, why are you then doing St. Anthony two? There's Mr. Always, Griffin. I'm so, I'm sorry, uh, Representative Wagenius. Mr. Chair, Representative Lugini. Um, even though when, when we put these in, I have, they're obviously powered. We have a backup electric, electric generator, so should the power go out, we still have full control. Um, there's always good to have a, have a factor of safety if, you know, hypothetically if the core wants to do some work on the lock and dam in the future. I mean, there's just always something that it's, it's good um, business practice to have a backup. To me, with all the resources that we're protecting upstream, three and a half million dollars to have a backup is cheap insurance policy. Follow up, Representative Wagenius. Well, I, I still, if you're saying it's 100% on one hand and then saying we're going to spend three and a half million because it's not 100%, I mean, I, I have questions about that. Okay. But I do, but I do like that going down to the lower lock a lot. Uh, the number two. I think we all should be talking about that. Uh, but my second question is, Mr. Chair, can we have uh, the Corps of Engineers here and talk to them and ask the question, how long will it take to permit this? Because we have no control. We can say that um, uh, we would like this done fast. But the state doesn't have a control here. It's the federal government. So could we ask to the, actually the next hearing uh, ask the Corps of Engineers to come and uh, tell us what they would do in this if, if we gave them the money and had it right there. Thank you for that question, Representative Wagenius. Um, DNR is uh, staying in the room for the next 14 minutes, and they're leaving from here to go meet with the general from uh, the U.S. Corps of Engineers. So 
we're hopeful at our next meeting we'll know what the general thinks of this uh, proposal and they're delivering a message that I'm beginning to hear from this group um, that uh, we're taking this serious we're looking at how can we find 13 million dollars to move this forward so I think they're going to deliver the message to the core that we want to look at the possibility of moving forward here and what roadblocks are the feds going to put in the way of making this happy and happen as soon as possible so I'm hopeful that our next committee hearing will be back before us we will have an opportunity uh, we will invite the core to specifically be here uh, and hopefully they will show up and uh, explain their position uh, of how cooperative they can be thank you representative Buginius. Um representative Hansen my, uh, my question was asked oh thank you uh, representative Anderson Thanks, Mr. Chair, and mine kind of was also, but I, I would just uh, follow up on, on some of the construction things. If these three projects were categorized or prioritized, would you agree that the, the lock and dam number two would be of the highest priority because it protects two rivers? Okay. Uh, Mr. Griffin. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Hansen, uh, depends on if you're a gambling person. Yeah. Murphy's Law would be... Uh, we we put the money in to build lock and dam two immediately, and we get six inches of rain in, in seven hours, and it would go around it. But uh, that you know, I love lock and dam two because you killed two birds with one stone. Uh, on the other hand, it's not 100 percent until you spend the additional 20 million. It, Mr. Griffin, just to clarify, and and we'll have the DNR when they go to the core. I don't believe a rain event has ever caused uh, lock and dam uh, two to be bypassed. If I'm not mistaken, in my lifetime, it's only been open uh, originally in the spring. Last summer, it may have stayed open longer because of additional rain events. But I don't know if a summer rain event, maybe Mr. Griffin knows, but I don't remember that. Um, when you, you say bypass, I, I'm sorry, uh, do, do, Mr. Do, Chair, at, at Lock and Dam 2, there's never been an event where it's washed around. It's not like Lock and Dam 5 or something further downstream where you have wetlands and stuff where it can wrap around. It's always going to be confined even on a 500 year event it's either going to go through the lock or it's going to go over those gates however in the 65 flood the differential between the headwater and tailwater was only a foot and a half and so when it's only a foot and a half the carp could get through if we didn't have the additional barrier put in correct thank you i have um uh representative canoe Thank you, Mr. Chair, um, and this may be for Representative Hackbarth, and I appreciate the presentation about the possibility of different barriers and electric barriers, and I'm just curious, um, when we appropriate money, it's, you know, millions, upwards, over $10 million. Are there other companies that do this? Would there be an RFP process? How does that all work just to make sure tax dollars are being spent um, most efficiently? Mr. Chair, uh, yes, absolutely, it'd be an RFP process. Uh, I don't know how many companies do this. I think there's other companies that do bubble barriers and things like that. I haven't checked that out, but uh, I, there's probably other companies that do it, and there would be an RFP process, yes. Representative Deal. <clears throat> Thank you. Well, Representative Wagini has brought up a good point. Uh, Mr. Griffin is saying that this is 100%, but it's a hundred percent when it's operated representative Dill, can you speak into the mic <clears throat> it's a hundred percent when it's operated in accordance with the operating specifications now people are human I mean there's live wells there's a lock and dam operator that might open the lock before he remembers to put the electricity on I mean things can happen that are beyond the capability of the infrastructure that you that you put in and I think that's what he means by uh, the fact that the insurance is, is the permit, the complete barrier at St. Anthony Falls, but regardless of the situation, that will be the stop of all and all. And I think that's what I understood from the presentation. <clears throat> uh, lastly, or secondly, as I, I had the opportunity to have this, the preserve, uh, protect, and enhance language in the game and fish bill that passed and put it on the ballot. And one of the things that encouraged me to, to have that, actually a bill originally authored by Representative Sertich, was the fact that it did the money would go to preserve, protect, and enhance. And I can't imagine the resources north of here, particularly, 
uh, to this state, not to diminish the southern resources, but getting infested with carp. And I think it fits perfectly with that mission. And lastly is, is if we don't really look at that 20 million real hard, and it's going to happen in that flood uh, where it gets five to six foot differential that they can jump, happens every uh, seven years. I mean, the odds are that this year we're going to have a flood and it's going to be within two or three feet and they're going to jump over the darn thing and there we'll sit. I mean, it's just going to be a risk that we'll have to take. Uh, but if we wait two years, we've essentially doubled the risk or even possibly more than that. So I think that's how important this is. And I think we should move at flank speed to find a solution. Thank you, Representative Dill. Representative Draskowski, and then I'm going to ask the DNR to come down. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a comment. Uh, you know, I, I agree with Representative Dill. Uh, the Constitution, as it's written uh, around the use of these uh, legacy dollars, uh, this is exactly the type of thing that you're supposed to use that for it, it, rather than continuing to purchase land in this state. So if we are going to do it, I think that's exactly the place it needs to, to come from. Uh, one question I would just leave everybody with is what happens when, uh, you know, people uh, people do things? Uh, you know, uh, what happens when uh, somebody takes a, a bucket of carp and drives up the road 10 miles to the upstream side of everything that's developed here and dumps them in for whatever motives they have? Did we just waste $13 million? Just a question. I don't have the answer, Mr. Chair. Good question, though. Um, uh, I, I, Representative Hanson. Well, Mr. Chair, I'm having a bill drafted uh, to prevent malicious transport, and we'll be looking for uh, Representative Draskowski to co-author that. Uh, well, Ms. Taylor's working on it already. <laughs> Representative Hanson, you, you said to prevent it. I would imagine it uh, will be to penalize those that right, do yeah, such a stupid it. thing. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, I wish we could prevent it. Um, uh, Mr. Hirsch, if you could uh, come down, uh, and uh, Mr. Skinner, I don't know if you're coming with. It just uh, I, we have not had an opportunity to hear your comment on the pre presentation made. Uh, if you could specifically talk about, uh, I believe uh, Commissioner Landwehr has said he's interested in moving forward to look at the possibilities of an RFP. I think specifically, can you address uh, Representative Canoe's question about how an open RFP for millions of dollars would be done with the DNR to, to uh, be sure that we had integrity in an open bidding system and such uh, in the process. And any general comments, you've got about five minutes. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman, Member Steve Hirsch, Director of DNR Ecological and Water Resources. And uh, just a couple of things I'd like to, I'd like to talk about very quickly. Um, first of all, the DNR agrees that electricity is a better is a better technology at stopping the fish than sound bubble barrier. The concern all along with electricity has been the safety issue, and I'll get to that in a second. Uh, second of all, we have already been in discussions with the Corps about timing and how this would all work and what their process is. I think we have to keep in mind that the Corps controls these locks and dams, and so we have to go through their process. I talked, we, we actually had a meeting earlier this week and talked about the process we would go through. Their time estimate is about, <clears throat> excuse me, it's about a six month process, although they are very, very much on board with working with us and have indicated that they will try to expedite that and make that, that quicker if they can. But, but we are looking at probably something on, on the lines of you know, six months, maybe a little bit less, to go through their process for approval. Safety. Of, with electricity remains their, one of their number one concerns, and they would have to be convinced that Mr. Griffin's claims that these were totally safe were true before they would go, go ahead and, and allow something like this. They're particularly concerned about recreational boat traffic that goes through the locks. They're not as concerned about the commercial barges because you can have, you can take precautions with them, have have, have uh, rules and regulations that the commercial barges adhere to when they go through, but as we all know, the recreational boat traffic is a little bit more difficult to manage. And so that, that remains their number one issue. With, with regard to an RFP, there's, there seems like right now, there seems like there's maybe two different directions we could go here. We could do an RFP and, and somebody deliver a proposal for the best technology and, and not limit it necessarily to electricity 
see what people come in with with electricity, see what people come in with sound bubbles. The reality is, my understanding is it's, it's a sole source vendor in either case. Smith Root is basically the vendor that installs electrical barriers, and then I think it's a Ovivo is the vendor that, that installs sound bubble barriers. I think they may be the only two vendors that do that. So it may not, it may be, it may make more sense to really decide on the technology we want to use instead of going through an RFP process and then doing a sole source vendor justification, which there is a process for in state procurement. So to me, it seems like the best first step might be for Mr. Griffin or Smith Root to get together with the Corps and convince them, at least preliminarily, that, that this, this can be done safely as a lock because right now, they are, they're not saying no, they're willing to consider it, but right now they're just not convinced that that's the case. And, and then if we can get to that point and the course says, okay, yeah, it looks like we can maybe do this, then we could start the process, of, you know, their, what they call their Section 408 process, go through that, you know, get, get basically the permit we need to do this, and then, and then also, and, 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 then, and, then basically, and then basically go forward with the, with the project. And so, uh, we, we did have a meeting with them earlier this week. Next week, we're going to be meeting with them again. They're going to be bringing in their technical experts from Chicago. The Chicago district has more experience with electricity and barriers in general because they've been doing all that work in the Chicago area. This district, not, not as much, so they're going to be looking to the Chicago district for, uh, for guidance there. And so um, I, think, I think those are the main things. That, you know, I think I just wanted to reiterate that this is, this is a, the core really is, is in control here on what happens with their locks and we need to keep that in mind. Uh, the other thing is, is I, I, we do prefer electricity, but in any appropriation language that goes forward, it may be better to leave it, to not specify electric because if, if we do run into a dead end with electric, we would have the, the opportunity to go with, with the next best thing. And, um, and then another, another important thing is we don't just need dollars for construction. We need dollars for operation and maintenance. And we also need dollars for evaluation to see if these things are working. If we end up with sound bubble technology, we're going to need probably a backup technology in the lock chamber, something like the water cannons that they've been testing that would, that would uh, help mitigate the fact that the sound bubble barriers aren't 100%. And so we need, we need dollars for more than just the installation. So any appropriation, it would be very helpful if the dollars were available until expended instead of having the usual one to two year time frame. And um, Well, Director Hership, yeah. I may just because we're going to wrap up. Okay. Um, thank you. I expect this group to have serious discussions. I don't expect us, at least I would not support us moving forward to spend tens of millions of dollars on bubble technology based on what I've been hearing. Um, uh, but we're going to have that discussion here. And just to clarify, where there may only be one manufacturer of, of a specific product, it's not unusual for competitive bids. For the contractor that will do this work, probably wouldn't be the Smith Root Company or the bubble company. Uh, general contractors used to working in locking dams and removing concrete and stuff like that would be the kind of folks bidding on this work. And there's a very competitive environment out right now for those kinds of people to do the work, whereas it's not unusual to have a, a, an open competitive bid process and identify that what you're bidding on is to install a specific product. Uh, my familiarity with that was we could uh, bid as a former landscape contractor, bid to build a playground, and they would identify the type of playground equipment they wanted to have put in. But you would have a very competitive bid among a number of contractors knowing they had to use a specific kind of equipment. So that, I, and, and Director Hirsch, you've mentioned that. I also think I heard you say uh, you understand if the legislature decides to go with specific type that uh, as opposed to leaving it open-ended. I, I think... Uh, that we have that. I would ask that when you drive from here, it sounds like you're not going with the core today. That meeting's not happening. But I, I would encourage uh, Mr. Griffin to be part of the discussion and whoever else needs to be with the core, as um, we've all said here, that that's a very important event. Members, thanks for the very good questions today. This is very important. I appreciate the um, uh, bipartisan approach in looking at this and the openness of wondering where this money could come from. Um, uh, Representative Fabian, could you move the minutes from our previous meeting? So moved. Discussion to the minutes. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. Minutes passed and meetings adjourned.